I'll invite you this morning to turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation. The world is going to hell in a handbasket, and we Christians, like the little kid in the back seat, are saying with a big grin on our face, are we there yet? We Christians are not of this world. Though we are in it, as it careens inexorably toward destruction, we do not belong here. We have been rescued. We have had a kingdom transfer. We have new loyalties. And so as Christians, our cry, as we navigate this troubled, God-cursed world, our cry is, come Lord Jesus. And we pray, Lord, let your kingdom come down here. And let your will be done here as it is done in heaven. That's our prayer. We begin this morning our study of the book of Revelation. This is the capstone of our Bibles. The climax of God's self-disclosure to mankind. And if there's any book that needs some sort of an on-ramp, an introduction in our Bibles, it is probably this one. It is at times seen as enigmatic, dark, mysterious, incomprehensible, scary. And yet it comes with a promise of blessing for those who would read it. And so we need to think a little bit about how we will approach this book. I've laid out as an introduction for us this morning six questions. That'll frame our time together this morning. We're going to ask, what is the book of Revelation? Should we be reading the Revelation? How should we read the Revelation? What is the structure of the Revelation? What will we find in the Revelation? And how will we benefit from the Revelation? That's our map for this morning. You will have to listen at one and a half speed, I believe, for us to get through. So first question, what is the book of Revelation? First of all, the book of Revelation is singular. It's not the revelations. It is the revelation. This book is not properly titled the revelation of John or the revelation of John the apostle. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's look together at verse one. The title of the book comes from the first line in the original and in our English translations. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his slaves the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his slave, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. What is the book of Revelation? It is, first of all, a letter. This is a letter from God through Jesus to John to churches. John was imprisoned on the island of Patmos, AD 95, and he wrote a circular letter to the churches of Asia Minor. We'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. That is modern day Turkey. And John is imprisoned because of his testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he writes a letter to a church he had pastored for decades, to a series of churches in which he shepherded. The book of Revelation is not only a letter, it is also a prophecy. It calls itself a prophecy. Look at verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things that are written in it. Several other times in the book, four more times in chapter 22, this book calls itself a prophecy. That means this book is in line with the Old Testament prophetic tradition. And prophetic tradition meant direct revelation from God. These were God's words through the prophet. This is not mixed up with man's ideas. This is not adulterated with error. This is God's word. This is direct revelation. And in continuation with the spirit of Old Testament prophecy, John's prophetic utterances match and continue that which the Old Testament promised. This is a letter, this is prophecy, this is also historical narrative, but of a unique sort. This is future historical narrative. That is, John will detail for us events of world history that have not yet happened. 
And many have commented on the genre of literature that Revelation is. Uh, you may know what literary genre is. There's murder mysteries and there's television advertisements. Those are different kinds of communication. You know that a hashtag is different than an IRS form. LOL and 1040 have meanings in their contexts. You understand that as readers of those kinds of documents. Much has been made of the kind of document we're dealing with here in Revelation. And we need to understand it as a pastoral letter with prophetic future historical narrative in it. it. That it is a letter written to churches under persecution, facing suffering and hard times with pastoral implications, and it contains words about future history. And all of it is God's word. This book of Revelation is also a conclusion that it is the conclusion of God's self-disclosure. This book ends our Bibles. Have you imagined the Bible without the book of Revelation? At where all the other New Testament works end. And there's just sort of a dot, dot, dot. There are things that are not yet made right. And the book of Revelation brings all these things to its right close. Second question for this morning. Should we be reading or studying, or preaching, for that matter, the book of Revelation? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, first of all, it is God's Word. It is God's Word. 2 Timothy 3.16, God's breathed out Word is profitable. That applies to the book of Revelation. William Milligan has said, well, the book is there. It's in your Bible. And it must either be excluded from the New Testament or the church must continue her struggle to comprehend it until she succeeds in doing so. The revelation is part of the word of God. This consideration settles the whole question. The simple fact that a book has been given by the Almighty to man constitutes man's obligation to make every effort to understand it. And this book, unlike any other in your Bible, comes with a blessing promised for reading it. Look down at verse 3. Blessed, this is a beatitude or a declaration of happiness. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and who heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. This book comes with the promise of God's explicit blessing for reading it. Not only for reading it, but for understanding it so that one could heed it. This book also comes with warnings. Warnings not to add or subtract from it. Now, there are a number of ways you could add or subtract from the prophecy of this book. You could insert your own ideas, add a few words, Take words away you don't like. You could pull a Benjamin Franklin and actually cut out pieces of it that are disagreeable to you. But there's another way that we could subtract from this declaration from God, and it would by, be by simple neglect. We ought not do that. Turn to Revelation 22.10. Notice what John is told there. Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. The imminence of the events described here, the urgency that is required for living in light of those events, demand that this book not be closed, not be sealed up. And of course we should read it because the first word of the book is apocalypsis. That is an apocalypse, and, and we think of an apocalypse as a, a genre of film, or, or we think of some, you know, sort of desolate story after a nuclear holocaust, and you have to say it that way, nuclear. And an apocalypse simply means a revealing, a revealing. The verb form simply means to reveal, to disclose, to make clear, to make known. So far from this book being designed by God to conceal things or hide them in mysteries, God's purpose is to reveal things, 
to disclose his own mind and his own purposes for the future of humanity on this earth. So, of course, we should be reading this clear communication from God designed by him for us to read, to understand, and to heed. That leads us to the next question. How, then, should we read the book of Revelation? There is no shortage of debate on this question. Shall we read the book of Revelation as an extended allegory, or does it detail actual events? By the way, the first 300 years of interpretation of the book of Revelation took it as detailing actual events. And after the fourth century, the dominant view in the church historically has been to take it as an allegory. That was a shift. Are we to take the book of Revelation, therefore, as an impressionistic painting or a history of some sort, a detailed chronology of events. And if we take the book of Revelation as actual events, which ones does it detail? Does it detail events in John's day? Does it detail events of church history that are now past or maybe present tense for us? Or does it deal with events which are still future? And these choices divide the commentators, the scholars. There have been four major ways that Revelation has been interpreted since it has been written. Now, hold on with me for a little bit. This will be important to work through. It's important for us to understand sort of four divergent roads at the front end because we can only walk down one. And I want you to be aware of what the four roads are so that you know why we are choosing to walk down one particular road. The first major way that Revelation has been interpreted is the preterist view. It comes from a Latin word meaning uh, it's done, it has happened, something in the past. And the preterist view means that the events of the book of Revelation have already taken place. That the immediate context for John writing the book of Reve- Revelation were conflicts in his own day. And so some preterists believe that all of the events of Revelation depict the events leading up to the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. That it was God's judgment against apostate Judaism. For other preterists, Revelation depicts in chapters 5 to 11 that judgment of Judaism in A.D. 70. But from chapters 12 to 19, the overthrow of paganism in through the 300s A.D. In 311 AD, you had the Edict of Milan, which is the the Roman emperor's declaration that you're no longer allowed to feed Christians to lions for entertainment. It was the Edict of Toleration. They, They no longer allowed the persecution of Christians. This was seen as a great victory for the church. Two emperors later, the emperor declared the Roman Empire a Christian empire. And so this was seen as the overthrow of Roman paganism and the installment of Western church glory and victory. And so preterists will either either see the events of Revelation taking place up to AD 70 or up to the early 300s. They would then see Revelation 20 to 22 Uh, The thousand years depicted there in Revelation 20 and the glories of a new heavens, new earth in Revelation 21 and 22. The preterists would see that as the glory of the church in her triumph and the victories of biblical truth over error in this world today. It was in the late 1500s, a Spanish Jesuit named Ribiera who began to propose that much of Revelation's fulfillment happened in John's day. That's when that view sort of took off. In 1614, a Spanish Jesuit, Alcazar, developed the view systematically. And what he developed was in chapters 4 to 11, a church conflict with Judaism. In chapters 12 to 19, the church's conflict with paganism. And in chapters 20 to 22, the church triumphant in her glory. From Constantine, the Emperor Constantine in the 300s, down to his present day. So that was the 17th century. And all of that in Revelation was fulfilled by 325 AD. In our day, a full preterist believes that all the events of Revelation have already been completed. And a partial preterist believes that most of the events of Revelation have been completed. And what remains is the physical return of Christ, a final judgment, and the ushering in of the eternal state. That's the preterist view. 
The second road that's taken down the interpretive path for Revelation is the historicist view. This is sometimes called the continual history view. It sees the history of the church in the West from John's day to the return of Christ. In other words, the book of Revelation is a forecast of church history, primarily European church history. Joachim of Flores, who died in 1202, was a Roman Catholic monastic. He got a vision from God on Easter that unlocked the key to Revelation. And it told the story from Pentecost, or in some versions of this from Creation Week, up to Joachim's own day in the 1200s. He developed the first form of what's called post-millennialism. That is the idea that the church builds the kingdom and then Christ comes. He predicted the kingdom of the spirit would begin in 1260 AD, after which time Christ would come to the earth. Now, Joachim was committed to papal authority and to the Catholic church in Rome. But when the Franciscans took up his ideas, they believed that they were the true Christians. And then the Pope was the Antichrist of Revelation and Rome was Babylon. That was the Franciscan view. And of course, during the Protestant Reformation, it was natural for the reformers to pick up those same ideas. If you've read Luther and Calvin and any of our great heroes, you will find them time and time again referring to the Pope as the Antichrist. That is the way they are reading the book of Revelation. There is in this view a correlation between the text of Revelation and current events, whatever era you happen to live in. And so interpreters throughout history have identified in the events of history the details from Revelation. So, for instance, Mount Vesuvius' eruption was detailed. The, The seven deadly sins, which are the seven heads of the Antichrist. The barbarian attacks of Rome, there were ten of them. They are the ten horns of the beast. Attila the Hun is identified, the emergence of Muhammad and the spread of Islam. Islam is the beast from the sea who's given a death blow by the Crusades. Martin Luther is identified, the Protestant Reformation is identified, either for good or for bad. If you're a Protestant, you see the Protestant Reformation as a really good thing in the book of Revelation. And if you're a Catholic, you see the Protestant Reformation as one of the beasts one of the evil things in the book of Revelation. And in fact, in Martin Luther's translation of the Bible, uh, it was illustrated. So if you like illustrated Bibles, you would have liked Luther's. He had an illustration of the harlot, the, the prostitute riding the beast, wearing the Pope's crown. At the same time, Catholic theologian Peter Bungus worked out the numerology of Martin Luther's name to equal 666. So you could see both using Revelation to chide the other. Queen Elizabeth I is identified, the Turkish invasion of Europe is identified, the French Revolution is supposedly the earthquake in chapter 11, Napoleon, Adolf Hitler, and Mussolini are all figures in the book of Revelation. Many people who lived in Europe during World War II believed that they were experiencing the events of the tribulation, and understandably. Sir Isaac Newton and a handful of scientist friends believe that you could put Edward Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire that multi-volume history of Western civilization, side by side with the book of Revelation and find precise correlations between events that have happened in history up to their day and details described in the book. Some of the results of this approach have been a history of date setting. Because if you can identify all the events up to Revelation 19, you could predict when Christ would return, especially if you identified events with time stamps, three and a half years, 1260 days, 42 months. You could sort of do a countdown if you identified one of those events. Another result was that each generation of historical interpreters of Revelation was convinced that they were at the end. They were at the climax of history. Why? Because when people's attentions were drawn to the book of Revelation, it was usually because very serious things were going on in the world, and and we got to find out what those are in the book of Revelation, and we've got to find ourselves in this history. We must be near the end. And in each successive generation, as history progressed, the interpretation had to be rewritten to accommodate whatever new disaster, whatever new emperor, whatever new war, whatever new apostasy was taking place in history. And of course, the problem with that is there was no consensus. 
One observer of this view who is sympathetic to the view said, each student works the scheme out so that the end of time falls in his own time. And as each new generation rises, it's necessary to work out a new scheme for the identification of events. And you can find well over 50 different published schemes for this view. It, of course, requires allegory and spiritualizing of interpretations. There is a third road, and it is called the spiritual view or the idealist view. It is sometimes called a philosophy of history. It is often portrayed as a drama, a dramatic history, or dramatic poem. Uh, One author uh, has called his own version of this a theological poem. And the view of the idealists is that Revelation does not portray actual events. It portrays deeper realities. Uh, What Revelation sets out to do is give a symbolic representation of the cosmic struggle between good and evil. The drama that portrays out uh, timeless truths that replay again and again and again in cyclic fashion throughout history. God's sovereignty over evil, his care for the church, the church under struggle and persecution in the world of enemies. And some will see these cycles as repeating over and over again in the drama of history. And so the historical events line up with general ideas of cosmic struggle that are vividly portrayed in non-actual events in the book of Revelation. So there's not a one-for-one correspondence between prophecy and event. It's more like a series of pictures that leave an impression. And like an impressionistic painting, you're not to look at the brushstrokes. These are not the details you're looking for. You're, you're supposed to look at the whole and, and get an impression and then, and then see that realized in your own day in various ways. And this view was based on the Alexandrian school of spiritualized interpretation. We'll talk about that in a moment. Particularly, the idealist view finds its roots in a man named Tychonius in the late 300s. He believed that the thousand years of Revelation 20 was the time between Christ's first coming and second coming. And for a long time, the the view was actually taken as a literal thousand years until you got to about the year 1100. And then the math didn't work, and it was no longer a literal thousand years, but the idea of something like an idealized time, a a long period of time. This leans heavily on mystical interpretation. It removes the interpretation from the details of the text of Revelation. Instead, you are to float above the details to general ideas about the cosmic war between good and evil. And sometimes you could drop down from those general ideas into specifics in your own day. Augustine's City of God, and then the medieval, medieval Catholic interpreters that followed him in that, is that portrayal. There's evil in the world, there's good in the world, uh, they're at war with one another, God is orchestrating all of these things, and that's the general idea. Now, all three of these approaches that I've just described follow an allegorical or a spiritualizing approach to interpreting Revelation. And this has been the dominant view of church history for about a thousand years. The the allegorical interpretation of the Bible was birthed in Egypt, in Alexandria, Egypt, in the third century. One early church father, Clement, from Alexandria, and another man named Origen were responsible for propagating this view. They were opponents of what was the dominant view before them. The view that Christ would return to the earth and set up a 1,000 year reign on the earth. That was the view held by the disciples of John and the disciples of the disciples of John and their churches. They believed that this view was too too materialistic and too Jewish. So their views and, and the allegorical interpretation were influential for later men like Jerome, who translated the Bible into Latin, and for Augustine who was something of a forerunner of the Reformation in terms of a right view of the gospel. The result of all of that was that for the next thousand years, the church adopted this allegorical approach to the Bible, where the literal or normal or plain sense of the words is regarded as the lowest form of interpretation, the the ugliest version of understanding. 
What Christians needed, rather than the plain sense of the words, was the deeper meaning of Scripture that is to be found in the spiritual senses, two and three, and for some, even four layers underneath the plain sense of the words. And there is one more road. And of course, the the one you save till the end is the right one, right? That's, That's how we do that. The fourth approach attempts to understand revelation according to the plain sense of the words. It is the futurist view. The futurist view. That is, revelation describes in large part future events at the end of the age, culminating in the return of Christ to the earth, the establishment of his kingdom on the earth, final judgment, and the eternal state. In other words, we believe that Revelation depicts those events that are still yet to take place from our vantage point. Chapters one to four detail John's, uh, chapters one to three, excuse me, detail John's present day. We'll, We'll come to that. Chapters four and following detail the future from John's perspective. The futurist view accords with the prophetic sections of the Old Testament. If you take revelation at face value, according to the plain sense of the words, it is actually in agreement with the plain sense of the words from the Old Testament prophets. There is a direct relationship between how you read revelation and how you approach hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is that process by which we understand our Bible. What what tools do we use to interpret All of you do hermeneutics all the time. You're listening to me and you're interpreting what I'm saying. You're trying to understand my intent as I speak. Hermeneutics is simply the application of the rules of language to written literature. What hermeneutics will we use to understand the revelation? And our approach is that we use the same rules we use to understand all of the Bible. We will read revelation as we read other parts of the Bible. There is meaning, a single meaning in any given text, and there is significance for readers. And that significance can come in many layers. It is inevitable that a futuristic take on Revelation will lead you to a certain doctrinal position. That is, premillennialism. You need to know up front that that if we take Revelation at face value, if we apply normal plain language hermeneutics to Revelation, all views agree that if you do that, you will end up being premillennial. That is, you're going to read Revelation in its chronological order, and you have the churches in the first few chapters, you have the tribulation. In 6 through 18, you have the return of Christ in 19, the reign of Christ on the earth in 20, final judgment in the second half of 20, and a new heavens and new earth in 21 and 22. That's just what the text says. And so futurists would contend that we ought to read it as it stands. Again, this was the dominant view for the first three centuries by those who were John's disciples and the followers of John's disciples to a few generations. An objection is often raised to this futurist view. How could this have been an encouragement to readers in John's day to to get details about events so far off? I would suggest that this is actually the norm for prophetic literature in our Bible. I want you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. And we need to understand the ethical implications of the Bible's eschatology. What do I mean by that? The Bible talks about things that will happen, maybe in your lifetime, maybe a long time distant, and they matter to you right now. They must change the way you live. All right, listen to 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, the elements be destroyed with intense heat, the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be now in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning? Listen, you might not be here when it happens, and you still are to live a certain way. This is the norm in the Bible. 
Just because events are far off and they may not occur in your lifetime does not make them irrelevant to you and how you live. We'll see more of that as we go through the book of Revelation. But think about the fact that the Bible has always done this. Genesis 3.15 is eschatology. Right? That's the, the first early pre-gospel declaration of the gospel Right after the fall of man, where God is talking to Satan, and he says, a seed of the woman is going to crush you. (laughs) Has that happened yet? That snake is still roaming the earth, seeking whom he may devour. And until Revelation 12, he still has access to the throne and is called the accuser of the brethren. In fact, in Romans, Paul says the God of peace will soon crush Satan. Hasn't happened yet. So, from the very first pages of our Bible, there are promises from God for the distant future that radically affect how we live today. The the, the futurist approach is not a pie in the sky, uh, I just want to lose my life in things that don't matter for today, irrelevance. Uh, The Bible contends these things are dramatically relevant for us. Because a futurist view will lead us to premillennialism, we are going to take our time next Sunday morning here in the main service to look broadly at the millennial kingdom from the rest of Scripture. Uh, just to sort of see that this is well beyond the pages of the book of Revelation. We need to know that if we take a futurist view, that futurist interpreters can and have made the same error as the historicists by making correlations between the text of Revelation and current events. You remember how the historicists saw in the book of Revelation Napoleon when Napoleon wasn't there. Well, the futurists have done the same thing. I've got shelves of books with these things. Russia has been identified. The European Union has been identified. Some supercomputer named The Beast has been identified. Visa and MasterCard have been identified. Mikhail Gorbachev, Vladimir Putin, every new war in the Middle East have all been identified by futurist interpreters as events which Revelation portrays. And that is not the right approach. One of the results of that approach, just like the historicists, has been a futuristic date setting And there have been those very conspicuous actors who have said Jesus will return on such and such a date. And then he didn't. Well, such false teachers are sinning when they set dates. Why? Jesus said no man knows the hour of the day. Comes like a thief. It will be a surprise. There will be eschatological events that begin a countdown. And for those who live during that time... They have specific instructions. For us, we don't set dates. Can't set dates. To set dates, to make predictions and timelines is actually sin. We're in a big question mark. We don't know how long this world will keep ticking before the Lord comes back. Each generation of historical interpreters of Revelation that was convinced they were at the end, at the climax of history... Proven wrong brings in another generation that as history progressed, their interpretation had to be rewritten. Generations of people have come and have read the newspaper headlines, have seen the, the, the things going on in secret cabals, and have said, aha, that's it, that's it, that's it. Identify the beast. I know who the Antichrist is. I've got 666 worked out. I told you there were four roads. There's a fifth road. The fifth road is all of the above. Some interpreters do attempt to walk down divergent paths that are mutually exclusive. I don't think that's possible. I want to talk about some dangerous ways to read Revelation. I know this is under the heading of how shall we read Revelation. Um, This is really how to not to. Number one, systems over exegesis. What I mean by that is you have your favorite theological system, you have your favorite view, maybe you have your theological heroes, maybe you have your ideas, maybe you really like this ending or that ending as if the Bible were a choose your own adventure. And so when you come to texts, you must make texts yield to your system. 
We can't do that. What builds a system of eschatology, if it's rightly done? Exegesis. That is, drawing out of the text what the text means by what it says. What does that require? Patience, hard work, lots of reading, study, holding things loosely. Uh, If there is a single passage that torpedoes my system, I've got the wrong system. So we don't want systems to drive exegesis. Second dangerous way to read it is to read the book of Revelation in such a way that it contradicts prior scripture. Are we to read the Old Testament through the lens of our favorite way to read Revelation? Oh, now I know what the Old Testament meant by what it said because I've got this. Or should we go the other way around? Old Testament priority says we take God at his word. He meant what he said. He had single meaning in texts in the Old Testament. And that is the ground and the basis for everything else that is written afterwards. Because God doesn't lie. He doesn't disagree with himself. He doesn't change his plans. He doesn't reorder his decrees. God makes his promises. And the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And so we ought to read Revelation In the light of the Old Testament, through the lens of the Old Testament, not the other way around. By the way, the dependence of the book of Revelation on the rest of the Bible, and particularly the Old Testament, is unparalleled in Scripture. The book of Revelation has 404 verses. In 278 of those verses, an allusion to the Old Testament is contained, and in many of those verses, multiple allusions to the Old Testament Now, you won't find any citations where John says, as Isaiah said, and quotation marks. But the the book of Revelation is soaked with the Old Testament. Most commentators put the number at 550 Old Testament texts referenced in 404 verses in the book of Revelation. Uh, United Bible Society lists 676 Old Testament allusions. And Greg Beale gives the number at a thousand. This book is more dependent on knowledge of the Old Testament than any other book. If you want to understand the book of Revelation, you need to know your Old Testament. And at some level, we ought to read it the way Jewish readers would have read their Old Testaments. We ought to read the book of Revelation the way Jews in the first century would have read their Old Testaments and heard the book of Revelation. We'll talk more next week about the Hebrew feel in the very text of the book of Revelation. In fact, the book of Revelation is so heavily dependent on the rest of Scripture that we will from time to time take a break from the exposition to look more broadly at what the rest of the Bible has to say about the events described here. The Revelation isn't coming up with new things. It is, in fact, filling out details in a condensed manner about things the Bible has already addressed. The day of the Lord, the great tribulation, the repentance and salvation of Israel, the kingdom reign of Messiah on the earth, and the eternal state. All of that is in the rest of your Bible. I'll give you a third dangerous way to read the Revelation. For information only. To satisfy intellectual curiosities. To detach yourself from the pastoral intent from John, from Jesus, and the personal implications that God intended for us in this book. We need to recognize that instructions for participants in the events when they take place will be specific. Just like Jesus in the Olivet Discourse, he says, when you see these things happen... Read Daniel, the abomination of desolation, when that Antichrist stands up in the temple and says, I'm God, everybody worship me. When you see that, Jesus said, don't go down off your rooftop. Don't get your stuff out of the kitchen. Just flee. There are specific instructions to participants during that time. That does not remove from us the importance of implications from the text. There are things for us to learn. We will be indicted. We will be encouraged. We will be confronted. And this is true for any of God's people in any generation. One of the dangers of an information only or intellectual view of the book of Revelation 
uh, we will quickly get lost in trying to speculate about ideas, identifications, identifying the beast, identifying the number of the beast. This has resulted in much silliness. I know that Hollywood has made several attempts at depicting the events of the book of Revelation. And you know the nature, anytime a fictional or historical fictional attempt is made to portray biblical events, there's benefit and there's harm. Maybe we're helped, maybe we're hurt. You can decide for yourself where that scale tips. I have a low tolerance, frankly, for filling in the blanks. Some of this just leads to distraction. If we are not pressed by God's intent for us in this book, we miss the blessing. Part of the blessing is bound up in the reading, and part of the blessing is bound up in the heeding. That is, there is an ethical imperative for us. There is a life obligation in response to this book. It's what God has designed. And then there's the danger of ignoring the details. If we float over the book of Revelation, like like if we play hovercraft over any part of our Bible, we will miss the beauty of the details that God has designed. Like a a, a very fine-grained photograph. The panorama is made by the pixels. And so we're, we're not to hover over the details so that we miss them. We are actually to paint the whole picture with the fine details that God provides. When it comes to your Bible, do you want to see the whole forest or do you want to see the trees? And the answer is yes. You want to be in the habit of seeing the forest And the trees. By the way, this is not the same as identifying all the persons and events. The the other danger would be to identify all the details in the book of Revelation. If the book of Revelation describes an earthquake, oh, I know where that is, I know what it is, I know what it is, it's going to be on the Richter scale, or it's not an earthquake at all, that's a person, and I know who it is. (laughs) To, To understand the clarity of this book, does not mean that you have an infallible perspective on the identification of all the players. And this will parallel our study of the book of Daniel. If you were here on Sunday nights when we went through the book of Daniel, particularly the second half, and particularly where Daniel outlined intertestamental history, that is that period of world history that happened centuries after Daniel, but a century and a half before Christ. We can look back on intertestamental history and we can see what Daniel said and it came to pass exactly as he said it would and we can put names and places to the events that Daniel described because we're looking in the rearview mirror. There will be people alive during the time of the events of the book of Revelation who will be able to identify who the Antichrist is. (laughs) Everybody's going to know who the Antichrist is. We do not have to be in a race now to identify him. It will be obvious. It will be plain. He will make himself known. He will demand to be known. He will will demand to be worshipped by everybody on the earth. We don't have to go identify him now. Nor do I believe can we. Perspicuity or the clarity of the revelation does not equal specific identification of all the elements. So the danger for us would be sort of a newspaper headline fulfillment. Run to the newspapers, run to the blogs, find out what's going on in the world, and see revelations happening. No, it's not. It'll be far more obvious than we make it seem now. There's a danger here too in sensationalism in the place of exegesis. The kind of thing that actually discredits the study of the book. When the time comes, we will be able to identify, or the people who are here will be able to identify the events as they're taking place. Even as the Jews in intertestamental history could identify the the wars of the Ptolemies and the Seleucids and the Maccabean revolt. But you could not have done that in Daniel's day. Fifthly, closely related to identifying persons in Revelation with historical or current events is the setting of dates. We, we just don't do that. You can't set a date for the rapture, the return of Christ, 
or any of those events. Our next question this morning, what is the structure of the book of Revelation? I'll give you a simplified outline at first, and I want you to look at Revelation 1.19. Some books in our Bible sort of lay out the outline for us. Revelation is one of those books. It tells us what it's going to do. It tells us where we're going to go. Revelation 1.19 says this, Therefore, John, write. And then there's a, a threefold object of the writing here. The things which you've seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. That is Revelation's own threefold outline of the book of Revelation. Things present in John's day, or excuse me, things John just experienced in his day, past. Things present in John's day, and things future to John's day. What does that mean? Um, what you saw is the vision of Christ that John records in Revelation chapter 1. He had just seen the risen, glorified Christ, and the angel says, write, what, write down what you just saw. Next, John, I want you to write down the things which are. That's chapters 2 and 3. That is the current state in John's day of the churches. And what unfolds there is seven letters to seven churches in what is now modern Turkey, Asia Minor, the area where John served as pastor and apostle. I want you to write the, the, the state of the churches, encouragements, indictments to the churches there. And then write the things that shall be after these things. So what you saw is chapter 1, the things that are are chapters 2 and 3, and then the future things is chapter 4 and following. In the next slide, a little bit of a breakdown of, of more detail on those future things. What are the future things that shall be? I know it's small on the screen. There is an outline available to you on the website that has this. First, you have a scene in heaven in chapters 4 and 5, and then you have the telescoping judgment of God against the earth dwellers. That is the tribulation. And the tribulation covers chapters 6 to 18. And you have seal judgments in chapters 6 through 8. Trumpet judgments in chapters 8 through 11. And then something of a station break uh, where characters in the tribulation are identified uh, between chapters 12 and 14. And then you have the bowl judgments in chapters 15 and 16. Then another station break where you get a depiction of the judgment of Babylon in chapters 17 and 18. And, and all of that tribulation period is followed immediately by the return of Christ in chapter 19, which is followed by the millennial kingdom, thousand year reign of Christ on the earth in chapter 20, and then the final judgment, and then a hard break at chapter 21 and 22, where the present universe is destroyed and a new heavens and new earth are created. And then the book ends with a conclusion, chapters, chapter 22, verses 6 to 21. So that's sort of the roadmap um, for Revelation, very thankful that in the first chapter, John himself gives us the roadmap. Now, what should we expect to find in the book of Revelation? Number one, much that we don't know. We're going to read things, we're going to scratch our heads, and, and, and you might send me an email or a text, or you might ask your small group leader, hey, what's this? And you're going to get, I don't know, can't wait to find out. We'll see when we get there. We cannot have an infallible understanding of all of the details. We can't identify all of the players. We can't identify the Antichrist, etc. The second thing we'll see in the book of Revelation are symbols. Symbols. Every interpreter sees symbols in the book of Revelation. Symbols in literature do not make us run away from normal, plain interpretation. Uh, if, if I told you there were stars in the sky, you, you would think of astronomical uh, things. If I told you someone was a star on the basketball court, you know what I mean. That is a metaphor, but it, behind the metaphor is something real. So how do we address the symbols in the book of Revelation? Literal grammatical historical hermeneutics recognizes symbols, metaphors, figures of speech, just like other portions of scripture. The difference between the literalist and the one who spiritualizes is simply this. The one who's taking the Bible at plain language recognizes the reality behind the symbol. Whereas the spiritualizer sees everything as symbolic and meanings must be made. What I think is fascinating in the book of Revelation is to watch where the book of Revelation actually tells you that something is a symbol and then proceeds to explain it. 
And I'll give you a short list. The list is much longer than this. We'll see this as we go through the book. But seven stars in chapter one are seven angels. Seven lampstands in chapter one are seven churches. Golden bowls of incense in chapter five are the prayers of the saints. The morning star in chapter three is Christ in glory, chapter 22. The four horsemen are successive disasters as judgments of God on the earth in chapter six. A fallen star is the angel of the abyss, chapter nine. The great city, actually turn to chapter 11. This is a really good example just to look at. Chapter 11, verse eight. Speaking of the two witnesses, they're testifying the truth of God, and the world hates them, and then kills them. Verse 8, their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city. Oh man, I wonder what city that is. It is mystically called, and the word mystically, pneumatically, it's spiritually, it is spiritually called. So here is, here is a, a, a spiritualization, here's a metaphor, here's a symbol. It is called Sodom. Oh, wow, I thought Sodom got destroyed a long time ago. They're in Sodom? Did it get rebuilt? No, it is mystically called Sodom. Oh, it is also mystically called what? Egypt. Wow, that's where, uh, Sodom and Egypt. I looked at a map. They're not in the same place. And then it's described this way, where also their Lord was crucified. What city are we talking about? Jerusalem. You know the answer to that. You, you didn't need to go to some secret code. The Bible tells you right here that it's a symbol that Sodom and Egypt are metaphors for an actual geographical location called Jerusalem. It, it, it explains itself. The stars of heaven in chapter 12 are fallen angels. A woman and a male child are Israel and Christ. A beast from the sea is a world ruler in his empire. The beast from the land is the false prophet. The harlot, Babylon the great. We'll get there. That's chapter 17. The waters in chapter 17 are the peoples of the world. Ten horns are ten kings associated with the beast. And fine linen are said to be the righteous deeds of the saints. All these things are explained. The presence of symbols in the book of Revelation is not a license to make symbols out of things that are not. But when things are called symbols and then explained, take it that way. And when things aren't called symbols, you know what our default should be? Plain language. If it says it's an earthquake... It's an earthquake. I think that is the appropriate approach. What else will we find in the book of Revelation? Number three, all that was unraveled in Genesis 3, re-raveled in Revelation. Heaven and earth created, Genesis 1. Heaven and earth recreated, Revelation 21. Sin and the curse enter in Genesis 3. Sin and the curse exit in Revelation 21. Satan appears, deceives, and kills in Genesis 3. Satan doomed in Revelation 20. The tree of life lost in Genesis 2. The tree of life regained in Revelation 22. Death enters in Genesis 2. Death exterminated in Revelation 20. Sorrow starts in Genesis 3. Sorrow ceases in Revelation 21. Pain, thorns, frustration, sickness, disasters, war, decay, rust, entropy, separation from God's immediate presence. And you can go on and on and on of the things that are undone in Genesis that are remade, renewed in Revelation. Fourthly, we'll see theology. Theology proper, meaning a, 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 a clear, big, majestic view of God Almighty. We will see Christology, Christ like we haven't seen him before, pneumatology, the Holy Spirit. We'll see anthropology, soteriology, ecclesiology, all of it. The, the theology in Revelation is so thick, deep, glorious. We will see the church and we will see Israel, all of them there. And of course, we'll see eschatology, uh, end times theology. It has been said that 150 chapters of your Bible are devoted to the end times. All of this culminates in the book of Revelation. We will fifthly see worship. Is there information in the book? Yes, but every time you turn around, in heaven, angels and saints and living creatures and martyrs are falling down and worshiping, and Revelation is full of song. The songs that we sing in our churches today, we get the words from this book. We will see also the Bible's continuity or synchronicity. We will observe that there is one author over the whole book. We will see history's darkest hour, seventh. History's darkest moments. 
And if you think about history past, uh, the Black Death or, or a tsunami that wipes out hundreds of thousands in a moment or Attila the Hun or the Crusades or World War I, II, III, IV, whatever, it, whatever comes, the Holocaust, a Cambodian genocide, Joseph Stalin, the spread of communism, abortion on demand, all of the blackness and awfulness that has been human history, all of it pales in comparison to what's coming. It will be history's darkest hour. Jesus himself in Matthew 24 said, there has never been a time like it before, nor will there be after. Eighth, we will see the end of our Bibles, the conclusion. All the loose ends tied up, the apex, the climax, the ushering in of the culmination of everything. Right now we live in suspense. Don't get comfortable. Number nine, we will see mankind be all that you can be. Man at the fullest of his potential. There is a restraining on man's potential now. That restraining will be removed and man will live up to everything he can be and it will be awful. We will get assessment of churches, 10th. Uh, that's going to be really helpful for us. A diagnosis on, on the health of Grace Bible Church as an implication of what God said to seven historic churches in Asia Minor in the first century. Number 11, we'll see promise fulfilled. That is, we will see on display the faithfulness of God, the execution of his decrees, the olive branches, the, the rich root of the olive tree, which is Israel, cut off for unbelief, regrafted in through faith, us wild olive branches on the outsides, us Gentiles grafted in by mercy, God fulfilling all of his promises. There has never been a plan B for God. God has not jumped ship from what he decreed or what he promised because men failed in their part. God will succeed and do what he has always said he would do by his superintending sovereign hand. Twelfth, we will see judgment uncorked. Thirteen, we will see our home. Fourteen, we will see the behind the scenes reality that has always governed this world. Satan is the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air who works in the sons of disobedience. We will see the prince of darkness, the powers and the principalities, fallen angels, and we will also see the sovereignty of God and his angels behind all geopolitics. We will see the forces that are behind sin and deception in the world's condition. All will be stripped away. Things are not as they seem, friends. And Revelation strips away the veneer. And 15th, most importantly, we will see Jesus the Christ. Jesus is the primary subject of this book. Go back to Revelation 1. What is the opening line? The revelation of Jesus Christ. That is, the revealing of Jesus. Wait, hasn't Jesus been described in my Bible before this? Yes. <laughs> yes, he has. Um, in the Old Testament... He was the angel of Yahweh, the shepherd of Israel, the rock in the wilderness, the manna in the desert. There were the theophanies and the promises of Messiah. In the Gospels, we see his humiliation, his incarnation, birth, life, death, burial, resurrection, and his departure. In the rest of the New Testament, we see the theology of Jesus, the Messiah, explained. And in the book of Revelation, we see Jesus unveiled, revealed in all of his glory. He is the King of kings and He is the Lord of lords. He is the God-man. He will still bear the marks of being the Lamb slain, but He is unmistakably the conquering King, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is blindingly glorious. He is the judge of all the earth. We will see Christ in His glory. He is the subject of this book. How shall we benefit from Revelation? What will it do to us? I'm just going to testify to what Revelation has done in my own heart. Uh, the Holy Spirit perhaps has many more things intended for us than what I have on this list. We will be protected from false teaching. Uh, we will be built up in our anticipation. We will have the promotion of urgent living. Revelation will teach us to live for another realm. To live urgently, as if time is short, as if the car we are in the back seat of truly is careening towards disaster and we have things to do. 
The book of Revelation will ignite our evangelism. How can we read this book and look around at the world around us without compassion? Evangelistic compassion. This book will recalibrate our perspective. Listen, Revelation 21 begins with a new heaven and new earth. You will live forever. Most of your life is spent on the other side of Revelation 21. That has to shape how we live here. Revelation will loosen our grip on this world. The refrain related to Babylon, come out from her, my people, heaven cries. Do we have an attachment to the things that God hates, that he sets out to destroy, and that he will dismantle piece by piece until men left on the earth are left in utter despair? Are we holding on to those things like they're precious? The book of Revelation will help us in our trials, persecutions, and suffering. The book was written as a pastoral letter to Christians under persecution. Whatever comes, and we've had it mostly easy, most of us. Hard times will come, we will need this book. And then this book will inform and multiply our affections for God. If you love God, if you love Christ, you want him to be honored, to be vindicated. You want every knee to bow and every tongue to confess that your Savior truly is the Savior of all, the only King and the Judge of the earth. We want him to be glorified. And no doubt the Lord will do much more through this book. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, your revelation, your disclosure of your own heart and mind, your plan for the world, we ask that you would do in us, to us, for us, all that you intend by this immense and glorious revelation. We pray that you would keep us from dangers. We pray that we, as we study and read, would have your heart and your mind and your meaning and none else. And we ask that you would Bring about a holy people, an urgent people, an evangelistic, expansive people, as long as you give us on this earth. In Jesus' name.